Uh, my name is Amy Kurim. Um, so this is a webinar, Water Pollution and Control is for two hours. Um, I think uh, the two hour, two to four, that we'll spend like discussing this thing. In the meantime, we might take a few minutes break uh, in between maybe uh, after like say uh, three o'clock or so. Uh, the way that I'll do, I'll try to discuss everything over that we have in the slide to explain. Uh, you can ask question at any time that you want, or you can save your question for at the end of the the uh, webinar, uh, or you can raise your hand in there, or you can type your chat box. Then we'll go from there. Time to time, I'll check uh, check the chat box and maybe uh, respond from there. So, um, as I said, this is water pollution and control. So. The way that I, I um, started it, like, like outline, we'll, we'll try to introduce a little bit why water pollution is very important and how we can control it and mainly what, what are we going to do. Then water pollutants and their sources, uh, different type of pollutants, where they come from. So we'll try to discuss a little bit on those things. Then water pollution in rivers. Uh, this uh, course would be mainly like uh, confined to the surface waters. Uh, means in this case, I'm saying rivers means kind of surface water. Then in the surface water cases, we'll discuss the total maximum daily load, TMDL, what it means and how it works, what do we do with that. Effects of oxygen demanding waste in there uh, on rivers, biochemical oxygen demand, uh, BOD, and a few other things. Mm -hmm. So I see some question from, can we have a copy of the session with audio after it's finished to review at a later time if possible? I think uh, it could be yes. Uh, uh, I think um, the PDS source will have everything. Uh, so you should be able to have it. Uh, at least I will have the slide uh, for you if you want it at that time. So the, the BRD is another one by chemical oxygen demand under that. This is one of the measures. Then we'll see the graphical determination of BOD constant. So we'll have a BOD model and it will have a constant. Then we'll see how we can determine the model and other things like that. Then we'll see laboratory measurement of BOD. Uh, then we'll try to see a DOSAC curve or like how the water pollution happens and how it's uh, regenerate the, the, uh, the uh, condition over there. So we gain the condition, a good condition over there. We'll see that. Then effects of nutrients and water quality in rivers, meaning uh, nutrients mean nitrogen and phosphorus. If we have a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, then what kind of effects in there? That's what we are going to discuss a little bit. Okay, so here would be the, the, uh, the learning outcomes, learning objectives. So the participants will be able to identify water pollutants in their sources, define PMDL, BOD, and COD, uh, model BOD and calculate BOD5 and BOD ultimate, determine BOD weight constants graphically, and develop set curve or model or Streeter props model, and explain the effects of nutrients on water quality in rivers. So there's the thing uh, for like to be the objective of the course, learning objective. So under introduction, I would like to say the water usage, either it is river, lakes, ponds, or streams, is greatly influenced by the quality of the river uh, water found in them. So if I have a good quality water, the usage would be there. A lot of people would be interested in using. The, the usage that we have in generally Fishing, swimming, boating, shipping, and waste disposal have very different requirements for water quality. But fishing uh, has one quality, swimming, boating, uh, swimming, shipping. Swimming may have a better quality because uh, it will be contacting human body and other things like that. So that's why it has to be probably better quality. But most of the time it is uh, drinking water quality. So water quality management is concerned with the control of water pollution from human activity so that the water is not degraded to the point that is no longer suitable for intended usage. Meaning different parameters, we'll discuss the different pollutants and other things like that. If it is there uh, with certain level or certain limits, certain concentration, then it may not be uh, suitable for any purpose of usage or anything like that. So this would be another reason for that uh, water pollution control. Energy. So, uh, but it doesn't mean that the, we should not put any waste in the water because if we don't want to do that, then we have to do 100% treatment. It's impossible. And may not be uh, kind of like economic because of, we have a lot of water around. So if we have a higher amount of water and I put some waste over there, still after the dilution and everything, the water quality would be the, almost the same. 
So why you don't take some kind of natural process uh, advantage of it other than spending a lot of money trading? So that's what we're saying, how much waste can be tolerated or assimilated by water body, type of pollutants, discharge, and the manner in which they affect water quality might be known. So that's what we are learning over here, meaning we can put some waste in their water, but still the water quality will be the same uh, as if we don't put it in, or it should be intended usage. We should be able to use it whatever the usage we are planning to do. Originally, the intent of water quality management was to protect the intended usage of water body while using water as an economic means of waste disposal within the constraint of its assimilative capacity. Meaning, so like say, we would like to put something in there, right? But it would be polluted, but at some time frame that with the dilution, it may not be polluted. So that means we can use these process uh, to treat some of the waste with it. So that's the main advantage. In 1972, Congress established that it was the national interest to restore the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's water, uh, yes, because of the surface water quality control. In addition to making the water safe to drink, the Congress also established the water quality, which provides the protection uh, for protection of fish, selfish, and maybe, uh, like, say, whatever we want to call it. Um, so, and wildlife, as well as provide the recreation in the uh, on the water, in and the water, so in and on the water, like the boating and other things like that. So that's what mainly it is. So, okay. Uh, the, by understanding the impact of pollutants in water quality, the environmental engineer can properly design the treatment facility to remove these pollutants to accept the water. So that's why we need the water in uh, mostly wastewater treatment plant in this case, because uh, if we don't have any wastewater treatment plant, then we just discharge the wastewater directly to the river or lake or, or ocean or something like that, then probably it will not be self to So that's the main reason we have to do something treatment so it can come back to the uh, like so. So original quality or whatever it is. So what are pollutants and their sources? There are a few types of pollutants. Number one is the looks like uh, we have a uh, oxygen demanding materials uh, is POD and COD. There are two of those uh, we can think of. Uh, like so the nutrients, looks like the nutrients would be phosphorus and nitrogen and pathogens and suspended solids. Pathogens is mainly the disease causing bacteria, viruses and other things like that. So these are the one that we got. Suspended solid, it could be uh, sand materials and other materials or uh, colloidal particles and other things like that. So the pollutant in the water can be two different forms, right? One is called suspended, other one is called dissolved. So BOD, COD could be in the dissolved form, right? Or could be in the suspended form. Nitrogen most likely it is a colloidal form because the sizes are very small. So and nitrogen phosphorus could be in both, solid form as a uh, solid form as well as a dissolved form, depending on uh, what kind of uh, state of the nitrogen phosphorus is it? Is it somebody cannot hear me? Looks like I see a please adjust your mic higher. So I think I put almost a uh, hundred percent of my in the, the capacity that I have. So is it okay now, guys? You can speak up if you want. So you don't need to just I think. Yeah. So. Um, then the, the a wide range of pollutant discharge to the surface water can be grouped into two classes. Uh, one is called the point source, other one is called the non-point source. Okay. The domestic sewage and industrial waste are called the non-point source because we know where it's coming from. Because they are generally collected by a network of pipes or channels and conveyed to a single point of discharge into the receiving water. So that's why we already know it that this is the case, meaning is the point source. And the other one, the non-point source, uh, like say, could be urban agriculture runoff uh, characteristics by multiple discharge points. And these are called non-point source, meaning we don't know exactly where it is coming from because it's a combination of several sources and other things. So that's why it's called the non-point source. And point source, we know already a lot of stuff, especially like say, if it is coming from wastewater treatment plant area or maybe uh, a detention pond uh, then we know it where it's coming from. But other than this, we don't know where it's coming from. That's why it's called the non source. Now, 
There are a few cases we have to do, uh, we have to know like, so what are the, the combined sewer and the separate sewer, and what is the called the combined sewer overflow. So much of the non point source pollution occurs during rainstorm or springs, or snow melt, resulting to large flow rates and may put many even more to non point pollution are sourced from R1 storm water, and in particular storm uh, water collected in combined sewer that carry both storm water and multiple and municipal sewers. So the main disadvantage of the combined sewer is we have a one line that takes care of the, uh, the sewage as well as the, the rain, rain water. So that's why it's called the combined sewer. So the combined sewer, the most likely is we have to have an overflow because if we have too much of rainfall at some point, we may not have enough capacity to treat those. So in this case, our only option to is uh, like say, let some of them go because we don't have any capacity to treat them. So that's why it's called the combined solar overflow. Elimination of CSO combines minimize a non-point source pollution. So meaning, like say, if I if I do the separate one, I can definitely put another flat in this case. So that nowadays, the most of the cities, the, uh, the subdivisions they're building, so they do the separate sewer. They do the one the sewer line, other uh, they mean the domestic sewer line, other one is the stormwater sewer. Okay. So that's that one thing we are having a separate. So this table gives us a little bit of different types of pollutants and, and where they're coming from, the source of maybe. Either point source or non point source. Like oxygen demanding materials, like most of the organics, right? So oxygen demanding materials in organics, we'll discuss more uh, later on. So why it is uh, organics are on oxygen demanding. Uh, there are some northern organics also oxygen demanding, but organics are the most good. So domestic switch looks like it can have a uh, like nutrients, pathogens, suspended solid. Industrial waste looks like can have all of those, including heats, right? Heat and toxic metal, toxic organic chemicals, salts, and everything. The no, agricultural runoff can have everything except looks like metals because most of the time we don't have it, as well as heat. Because agriculture, yeah, I don't think we do anything that will raise the temperature of the agricultural water. Anymore. Urban runoff looks like almost everything except metal, chemicals, and hot. Uh, heat mainly they hear them. They are not part of it. So these are the sources of the the um, pollutants uh, from different sources and types of pollutants. This uh, kind of correlation to pollution. So uh, what are pollution in rivers? Uh, basically, major pollutants affecting rivers are BOD and ammonia. Why are they? Because BOD is uh, mainly organic, right? We define it. Uh, BOD defined as the amount of oxygen required by the microorganism to oxidize the organic content in the water. And ammonia is the same way because the ammonia has a ammonia and nitrogen over there. And ammonia can also create a oxygen demand because since we have a nitrogen, so there are two types of materials, carbonaceous and nitrogenous organic. So both of them can be decomposed by aerobic process that can put oxygen. That's why both are kind of uh, pollution in the rivers. So the, the adverse effects of ammonia could be toxic to the fish and oxygen demanding, it's a nutrient for algal growth, the nitrogen part, not the hydrogen part, but it can be separated and different nutrients. So uh, the objective of water quality management is simply to complete the discharge of pollutants so that the water quality is not degraded to an unacceptable extent below that natural background. So what is the natural background level? Natural background level means whatever the water is here. So it, it is available for some kind of intended use. It is not 100% blocked for usage or anything like that. So that's why uh, it should be a kind of background level. So the impact of pollution on the river depends on both on the nature of the pollution and the unique characteristics of the individual river, such as volume, speed of water flowing, the river step, type of bottom, and the surrounding vegetation. So all of those are kind of factors that helps the impact in the river for the pollution. Okay. So other factors include the climate of the region, the mineral heritage, that means mineral heritage could be some of the washout coming from the, the soil, the minerals uh, of the watershed, land use, pattern, types of the fertilizer in the region. Some pollutants, particularly oxygen demanding waste, such as like organics and nutrients are so common and have such a profound impact on almost all types of rivers 
that they deserve special ambassadors. So that's the kind of description of uh, what kind of things we have to do because we are dealing with pollution. So we have to know what is pollution, then how to control it. So now we'll define the term, uh, like say, total maximum daily load, TMDL. So under the section PO3B of the 1972 World Act, PWA, states and territories and authorized tribes are required to develop list of impaired water. Okay. So the impaired water are those that do not meet the water quality standards that the states, territories, the authorized tribes have established. So it comes mainly from the federal government, but it doesn't mean they have to follow the federal government. They can even stringent the rule more. So if the federal government says that, okay, suspended solid is 500 milligrams per liter, then the local, they can say, no, it is 250 milligrams. So the local the rule can be more stringent, but not relaxed than that of the, the federal government. So that means they have to minimum follow the federal government rules or they can make it more stringent, more strict. So that's the rule of the way it works. Okay. So yeah, here is the definition of the TMDL. TMDL definition is something looks like a TMDL specifies the maximum amount of pollutant that a water body can receive and still meet the water quality standards. So that means it has a assimilation capacity, dilution capacity. So that means the amount you put it there, after the dilution and weighting, the water quality will be still uh, following the standard, water quality standard that we require. So it is required by the law, as we said, two of these sections, two of these, uh, and then seven to three uh, yeah, water. In addition, TMDL allocates loading, that is mass of liter express pounds per day instead of milligram per liter. So I have a conversion over here. A one milligram per liter is equal to eight point three four pounds per million gallon. That may be contributed among point and non point sources. So we'll have something that the allocation for the point source and the non point source. So the TMDL is computed on pollutant by pollutant basis. Uh, again, yes, it is true for a list of pollutants uh, similar to those in table one. So we discussed the table one, other pollutants like that, organic, inorganic, uh, nutrients, materials, and other things. So here is the equation we can use for the TMDL. So it says that TMDL equals the summation of WLA, summation of LA plus MLS. MLS stands for margin of safety. LA is loading allocation for non point source, existing as central existing and non point source. And WLA waste allocation for the, the point source, future so existing or future. future. So these are, and this is like you know, factor of safety or margin of safety. Any, we don't want to exhaust it 100%, we'll keep it. 20, 30 percent, or 50 percent as a kind of safety, safety factor. So, in 1956, Congress enacted the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, this public law 92-500. Under that, under 1972 amendments of Federal Water Pollution Control Act and Clean Water Act, established a National Pollution Distress Elimination System, they call it NPDES. So NPDES is a permit system that uh, uh, allows you to have any kind of discharge. I mean, uh, you can have a discharge, but you have to have an NPDES permit to do that. And NPDES permit required that you take a sample, you do the a monitoring of this thing, different parameters, and you submit the report. I think most of the time quarterly, uh, depending on the size and other things, could be monthly, could be up to a little bit year. So, which calls for limitation of the amount of water quality, quality of affirm and before all municipal industrial distress petrol farms. This permit is called NPDES permit or GPDS for Georgia. I don't think it does. Uh, I think most of the time it is the NPDS, National Pollution uh, Distress Elimination System. It is by federal government. It is administered by federal government. Okay. So, any questions so far? Let me check the uh, any comments or anything. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So effects of uh, oxygen demanding waste from the river. Oxygen demanding materials is either organic or inorganic. As I said, mostly organic. Inorganic, there are very few inorganic can do that. Maybe just the nitrogen pathway. The past depletion of the diesel oxygen in the water. How they do it? Because the microorganism, the microorganism or bacteria, viruses, if we do the aerobic process, they need oxygen. They take oxygen, 
can decay if or, or decompose those organisms. So that's why the reason is that polyoxin the meaning. So uh, the organic works as a substrate of food at microorganism, and, and oxygen works as a lactin acceptor for this, so especially for the energy of the food. This process a uh, fed to fish and other higher forms of aquatic life to keep it from some sort of disorder for the aquatic life. Yes, like a human being, we need oxygen to survive, and we get oxygen from the air, right? Air has a 21 to 23 percent oxygen, so that's why we inhale uh, in air, and uh, from the air of oxygen, it hemoglobin takes oxygen and it does whatever it is to do. Similarly, uh, the aquatic life, fishes and other aquatic life, they take oxygen from the water. That means the, the water will have a dissolved oxygen. I will show a table. Uh, based on the temperature, the, the water can have a separation level of the oxygen in there. Okay, so uh, that's the another reason. They, the, the, uh, we need a uh, problem. If we have a lot, put a lot of organic material there, then the microorganism will decompose the organic matter. In the time, microorganism will absorb all the oxygen in the water. That means water will be without oxygen. So if the water is without oxygen, then the, the fishes and other aquatic life will not be able to survive because they are not getting the oxygen. Level. So to predict the extent of oxygen depletion, it is necessary to know how much waste is being discharged and how much oxygen is required to degrade the waste. So that's the another measure of the beauty. So learn more about it. So how we do things like that, the beauty will tell us. I mean, this is one of the parameters that we use to measure those things like that. Uh, because oxygen is continuously being replenished from the atmosphere by aeration or, or from photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is not that big a deal because it's uh, like a process by a plant. If we have any plants in the bottom, then it might be, otherwise it's not. So by algal and aquatic plants, as well as being consumed by organisms, the concentration of oxygen in the river is determined by relative waste of those competing glasses. So it means like, so how much they are taking out is minus, how much is coming, adding it to up is plus, or whatever is already there is plus, and, and, and so on. So it's a competing processes, the, the uh, like so algebraic solution. Organic oxygen demanding materials are commonly measured by determining the amount of oxygen consumed by the degradation in a manner approximate degradation in nature. That means this is another uh, simple definition of BO. So we measure it through the BO, right? Chemical oxygen demand. So now we we'll go to the biochemical oxygen demand. Here is the definition of the theory. Theory is the amount of oxygen consumed by the microorganism as the consumed biodegradable organic matter. So, so this is the one. The amount of oxygen required to oxidize a substance to carbon dioxide and water may be calculated by sodium if the chemical composition of the substance is known. This amount of oxygen is known as theoretical oxygen demand. So if we measure something like that. Uh, like the amount of oxygen we need, then it would be called critical oxygen demand. But if we do the same thing in the lab, then we call it here the right critical oxygen demand. So here is a picture is showing. Looks like uh, this is a chicken. Chicken is uh, what? It looks like uh, this is organics, right? Glucose in here. That means in this case, uh, definitely uh, this, if we put it in there, it would be kind of oxygen demand material. Because it has organics. So, so here is one example I would like to do and uh, just to discuss and see whether uh, so whether we can understand this uh, problem. So where it's asking is compute the theoretical oxygen demand of 108.75 milligram per liter of glucose. Uh, like so, if I have 108.75 milligram per liter of glucose, then how much oxygen I need? Uh, that means how much BOD I need about the theoretical oxygen demand. That's what we are going to talk about. So the chemical equations, these are the chemical equations, right? This is glucose plus oxygen, then it's uh, becoming six carbon dioxide in six water. So what I did over here, I did the molecular weight over here. So I did the atomic weight for carbon is 12. I have a six carbon. So then 12 times six would be for this. Then plus, I have a oh, hydrogen uh, atomic weight for hydrogen is one. And I have 12 hydrogen is 12. Then I have a six oxygen, and each oxygen has a 16. Atomic weight is 16. So that's why uh, 16 times six will give me the number of 
then the, here it is 6, total 6. How many oxygen? We have 16, and each oxygen has a 1, 2 atom in there. So that's what I have. So I didn't calculate the other one because I didn't give those. So in this case, I have 180 gram or whatever we can call it of a mole, mole gram in this because of one mole. And then I need 192 in this case. So that means in order to oxidize or like say, uh, like decompose 180 gram of uh, glucose, I need 192 of uh, oxygen. So, okay. so now if I have a glucose of 108, then how much oxygen I need, okay? So in this case, what I'm going to do, this divided by this and this will give me that. So does it take 192 gram of oxygen to oxidize 180 gram of glucose to carbon dioxide in the Therefore, theoretical oxygen demand of that much glucose is equal to this times 92 divided by 180. So divided by 180. So ultimately, I got 116 milligrams per liter of oxygen that I need to do. That. If I do this way, then it's called theoretical oxygen demand. Uh, but if I do in the lab, then it would call them just a beard. That would be uh, Okay, so any questions on this? So everybody is okay with that example. It's very simple chemistry. So these are chemical equations, and we just calculate like a so ratio time with the ratio time. And very nice. Okay. Okay, then the next definition is the chemical oxygen demand, CO2. Uh, chemical is like very similar definition. The amount of oxygen required to oxidize the organic matter by strong oxidizing chemicals. So, uh, strong oxidizing agent like potassium diacrylate under acidic conditions. Yeah, something like that. So, that's why it is called the, the uh, CO. So, here you see some of those is showing over here. Okay, it's showing something over here that uh, likes a CO. And here it is a uh, lot of electrolyzing. And it's uh, chemical uh, reactions is happening. So that's why they call it CO. So, during the determination of CO, the organic matter is converted to carbon dioxide in water. We get this biological assimilation into the substances. One of the chief, chief limitations of CO test is inability to differentiate between biologically oxidizable and biologically inert organic matter. In addition, it does not provide any evidence of the rate at which the biologically active material would be stabilized under conditions that exist in nature. So that's why COD value is very good, uh, but the BOD is very important also to know that the, the how quickly or how what is the rate of disappearance of those things in the decomposition process. So that's why BOD COD would evolve. Uh, it's not just one. But there are some advantages, disadvantages of COD and also BOD. So in case of the COD, because BOD is not possible, especially Toxic industrial waste. If we have an industrial waste with very low pH, or there are some toxicity over there, okay, or very high pH, then we cannot do BOD because there is no microbes in BOD. So no BOD is, is can be done. So in this case, COD is definitely the best one. But there are some relationship between BOD and COD. So COD is usually greater than or equal to BOD yeah, because of uh, something like that, uh, we can say. Okay. The major advantage of COD test is that it's short time, it takes three hours, whereas the BOD5, it takes five days to get the BOD5. So BOD, ultimate BOD takes more than 100, uh, 100 months, sorry, uh, 80 to 120 days. We don't want to wait that long. That's why industry standard is to use five years. The amount of oxygen required in five days. Okay. So that's what we use. For this reason, it is used to substitute for the BOD test in many substances, many instances. Uh, it's not really substance, but at least considering instead of the BOD values. The COD test is used extensively in the analysis of industrial waste, as I mentioned. It is particularly valuable in surveys designed to determine and control losses to show excesses. Result may be obtained within a relatively short time, that means three hours, to measure uh, take and to correct errors on the day they offer because it's three hours. Whereas BOD bar, we have to wait for five days, right? So that's why. The COD has the advantage in this. But the COD has a deal advantage is it doesn't give me that much as the variable and variable the other right? We have to do the COD test on it. So application of COD data. Uh, BOD COD data both are basically similar uh, usage. 
Number one, how strong the waste is, how bad it is. Strong means in this case, how bad it is. Is the higher, higher beer value or CUD value? That is bad, right? So, uh, in this case, the conjunction of the beer test, the CUD test is helpful in different types of conditions, presence of biological uh, resistant organic toxins. The test is widely used in operation uh, of the treatment facility because the speed with which results can be obtained means three hours. So that's why in uh, the waste product treatment facilities and different treatment facilities, they use this kind of data. Okay, so that's the use of uh, CAD, application of CAD. Now, this topic is uh, BOD module. Now, why do you need to do the model? And there are two parts of module. One is called the, the mathematical modeling and physical modeling. And this is definitely mathematical modeling. So that's what we're doing. Okay, now, uh, as I mentioned before, most of the time, so also depending on the type of waste and type of uh, contaminants are there, right? So or, or the water and waste water in their combinations. So it might take to get the ultimate beer, it might take 120 days, right? Up to 120 days, sometimes. But uh, as we said, the industry standard is only five days. Yeah, five day beer fine is fine, but it doesn't mean five day beer will satisfy us with all of this. We still need to know what is the ultimate beer type, what is the two dollars strength of the waste. So in order to do that, what we can do, we cannot wait for 120 days to do the testing to get the results. So in order to do that, we can create a model in mathematical equations. Then from the mathematical equations, if we know five day BOD, three day BOD, or maybe one day BOD, we should be able to calculate the ultimate BOD, whatever the final value would be. So that's the reason we have to do the model. Modeling is like say something that we cannot do or we cannot wait on a remote area or anything, but based on the information that we have surrounding, we should be able to estimate using a certain equation. So that's called the model. So in order, there's the main reason of the modeling, not medical model. So we'll do the same thing over here. So uh, the uh, most of you guys probably know that is the first order, zero order, and the second order kinetic. Uh, means in this case, first order kinetics is the rate of change with the time is proportional to the one power. So most of the cases, I mean, almost every cases, the BOD follows the, the first order reaction, first order kinetics and other things like that. So first order kinetics, if you follow that, then that means this is the, uh, like say, amount of oxygen demand that is left. The LT over DT is equal to K, negative KL. So why the negative sign is here? First thing is, excuse me, this is a proportional to LT, right? But then we have an equal to sign uh, is equal to negative k. Negative k means is going down with time. So negative means it is going down with time. So that's the meaning of it, negative sign, okay? So then k, k is a, a proportional constant. So this k is called the reaction rate constant, okay? Or BOD rate uh, constant, the BOD reaction rate constant. So rearranging the above equation, that means if I rearrange the above equation, that means the separation of variables, right? Uh, DLT over in here, I can bring this, and I can take the DT from here to uh, the other way. If I do that, that's what it becomes. Then here it is, looks like my, I have some, if it is zero time, then it would be initial, what about the amount is, the how close to the ultimate BOD, or what about the initial organic content over there? At any time T, it would be LT. That means we don't know, we'll just create a equation. Okay. If I continue, then this is a law, law natural logarithm LT over L0 equal to KT. So ultimately I got the equation of this, LT equal to L0 in, into A to the power minus KT. So in here, L0 is the ultimate coherences of sin demand, this ultimate BOD, which is the total of sin demand required by the microorganism to oxidize the coherences part of the uh, waste. Then L0 is also referred as the ultimate BOD, or BOD U or ultimate BOD. So that's the final value. This would be the highest value in this case. We need to know it because of it has some values in different cases. Now, uh, if we use L0, uh, L0 equal to uh, BODT into LT. So I need to show you a graph before I go here in this case. Uh, here is the graph. So graph is, this is the one, this graph, this graph is the one that we did LT equal to L0 into Z minus KT, right? Now, this is the one that means the remaining. Now, if this is the original one, then original one, total one, 
minus whatever the remaining will give me how much has been used, right? So my BOD uh, at any time, T would be just this part. And this part would be basically, so whatever uh, we have in there means like, so whatever the total amount L0 minus LT at any time, okay? And this is the BOD. The other part is the, this is the remaining BOD. That means how much oxygen there. This is BOD exerted, how much it is. So BOD exerted would be L0 minus LT. If I know the whole thing and I know this is LT, so I should be having the divide in this. This is equivalent to same as this. So from here to here is equal to same as this. Okay. So that's the reason that we have to have, um, so it's a negative sign over here. I should have this back here. here. So that means my L0 total is be equal to BOD at any time. And this is the, the at LT, the remaining at any time. So that means the BOD would be L0 minus LT. LT, we already know this equation. If I put it in here, so ultimately it's becoming L0 into 1 minus C2 minus KT. So BOD at any time T is equal to L0, that means ultimate BOD, into 1 minus C2 1 minus KT. So that's my equation. And there's the equation we can use to uh, calculate anything um, if I know the other things. How many unknowns we have in this equation? Number one is the BOD at any time. If I know the five day BOD, so I know the BOD as well as T equals five day. L0 is ultimate BOD and rest of them unknown. So it looks like three unknown. One is the BOD and the time, another is L0, other one is the K, right? So four unknown in this case. If I know any three, then I should be able to find the, the, the fourth one. So, but there is a relationship. If I say BOD5, means I already know T. T means is equal to five. So in this case, uh, ultimately it is two. Uh, uh, I mean the three parameters unknown, three unknowns in there. If we know the two of them, then we should be able to calculate the third one easily. So this is the way, if the handbook has this way, then this equation is an e base because I took the natural log over here. This can be done also the 10 base, means y equal to L0 into one minus, it is one minus capital KT. We have to be careful on that. This is a small K and this is the capital K. So there are some differences. The relationship between these two I'm going to show now. So in this case, the small K, that means the E base K is 2.303 times of the, the 10 base K. So here is the, how it comes out to be. This is logarithm 10 E base, logarithm one over logarithm E, 10 days, so equal to 2.303. That's why the multiplying factor came out to be. Yeah. So E base to uh, the, the 10 base to E base, if I convert it, then I have to multiply with 2.303 to convert into E base. So E base one has a bigger value compared to the 10 base one. And this equation, this equation gives us the adjustment for the K value uh, at a temperature, different temperature. Most of the time it is 20 degrees, the center temperature that we use to calculate that, but if my field temperature is less or more, then we use this equation to adjust the value of K. So KT is the rate constant at a temperature T degree, and 20 is at 20, and theta is the temperature coefficient, 1.135 for 4 to 20 degrees Celsius, or 1.056 is uh, 20 to 30. Usually I use this one, 1.047 for any temperature. So this is just 10 of half. Here are some of the typical K values, small K and capital K. Small K is the E base, capital K is the 10 base. Right, raw waste is 0 0.25 to 0.7. Here it is, uh, it's just uh, what, divided by 2.303, right? Then the world treated waste is 0.1 to 0.23, and just this divided by this, whatever the conversion factor I gave you there. And the pollu polluted river water has a 0.1 to 0.23, the same well-treated sewage is very close to the polluted river water, things like that. So the, the uh, factors affecting the K values, K values be the rate constant, number one, nature of the waste, ability of organism to use the waste and the temperature. So we have seen that the temperature effect is basically due to this equation. If the temperature goes higher uh, with, the, with the time, right, that means this would be positive, so that means KT would be uh, more than K20. So that means in this case, what? Well, it will be more quickly decomposition process is going to happen. So more quick decomposition process will happen. So that's why it's a high temperature, the decomposition happens more than probably we spend that, right? uh, during the summer season and other things. So this already, I, 
mentioned that this is the this curve is the beauty exerted this curve is uh, beauty remaining so if i know the beauty remaining i know the total then the total l0 and from here this is lp then it becomes l0 minus lp that means the beauty ultimately from here to here is the same way from here to here that's what we call it beauty t equals l0 minus lp and lp value we already know we put it in there and we the, the nitrogen oxidation, so carbon SCS oxidation and nitrogen oxidation. So far, assumption was that only the carbon in the organic matter is oxidized. Actually, uh, uh, actually, many carbon in organic compounds, such as protein, also contain nitrogen that can be oxidized with conventional molecules. So logically, oxygen consumption due to oxidation of carbon is called carbon SCS theory. And while due to the nitrogen oxidation is called nitrogen as theory. So here we are saying it, but I don't think both are CVO. Most of the time, CVO is a standard. Uh, but some cases, uh, we may have to do that. I have an example over here how to calculate the nitrogen as theory. And this graph will tell us, like, say, when the nitrogen as theory stops. So in this case, 5 to DOD looks like it's mostly carbon ACS. In seven or eight days, then the uh, nitrogen is really stops. After that, I mean, the before that, it didn't even stop. And here is the carbon is of it Looks like this part may not have any nitrogen is really because it didn't stop process, right? So it doesn't have any. So up to uh, 10, eight or 10, uh, looks like we should be okay without any problem. Okay? So something like that. So here is a, a more example here. Uh, this one is looks like for the treated switch, uh, and it came a little bit earlier. For untreated switch, looks like it is around seven or eight days. At this time. Here I have a small uh, example problem. So if I have ammonia, then oxygen, my is here, nitrate, uh, water, and hydrogen. From this reaction, the critical NDD can be calculated as the grams of oxygen used, the grams of nitrogen oxidized. Uh, so grams of oxygen oxygen used to be equal to one. So if I calculate all of those here, so then it'd be uh, what about like four times sixteen, right? Means six. Uh, okay. So yeah, four, sixteen, four times sixteen, because I have a two times sixteen times two. That's yes, so four. Times. And grams of nitrogen oxidized. Nitrogen oxidized uh, looks like only one nitrogen here, right? Only one nitrogen has a fourteen. A gram, I think, two times four gram or two gram. So it be fourteen. But we put in the thing by fourteen is equal to four point five seven gram of oxygen per gram of nitrogen are required for NDA. So that's how we can calculate the NDA. So any questions uh, so far for anything? Uh, looks like it. No questions in the chat box. So, Okay, so now I'm going to solve one problem. So let's see uh, the one problem here. If the BOD3 of a waste is 75 milligram per liter, and the K value, you remember that capital K, capital K is for 10 days, small k is for uh, E days, is 0.15 per day. What are the ultimate BOD of uh, BOD U or L0 in the 5 day BOD? So it is given like to the BOD, and it's given the K value. Two things are given. The third one we are looking for is a BOD5. Sorry, yeah, BOD5 and BOD5. So, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to use both 10 days and E days. So, since it is given in 10 days, so here is my equation of the 10 days. These are my information given. So, if I put 3 to BOD75, if I do 0, 1 minus, it is a minus, uh, would be uh, K, would be 0.15 T. So, if I put 3 to uh, three BOD, then I put here 3. So ultimately, only L0 is unknown here. So L0 we calculate, it came out to 116 milligram per liter. So same thing I can use as a E days. Okay, E days means what I have to do, I have to convert the K into small K. The small K is equal to 2.303 capital K, right? We know that it is perfect. So if I do that, then I got uh, like say small K is 0.345, right? 0 0.345. Then I have to use the equation. Uh, the uh, the e ways equation, so I got the same thing, right? Now I have to use the 5 dBOD to find the 5 dBOD. Since I know uh, ultimate B is 116, so 5 dBOD equal to L0 into 1 minus 0 minus 50, 
116 we already know from here and i know this is 0.15 because this is the e uh, sorry 10 days is 1.5 and 2 is equal to 5. so i got 95. if i use the e days formula so you have 0 to 1 is minus 1 minus it is a minus kt and i put the value together then ultimately i the same so i got very close to the same it's a little bit different 9.25.2 95.37 so what are ultimately after the the rounding it is the same so i don't see any difference so this is one of the ways we can solve the problem that is we know one value or two values then we can find the third one from this uh, equation so that's the advantage of uh, having the mathematical multi reference type. okay guys any questions on anything so do we have any questions you can raise your hand from the there, or you can type your questions uh, or anything. Okay, I don't see any chat or anything like that. Okay. So, uh, here is the problem. Uh, like I said, this problem, if we would like to solve this problem, so how can we do it? If the BOD5 of the waste is 210 milligram per liter and BOD ultimate is 360, what is the BOD rate constant? K? Or capital K, small k or capital K. Answer I gave you here. The answer looks like I gave you, but the only issue is how we can solve it, right? We'll see whether we can solve it. Let's see if I can write or something here. Okay, right, so this will work. Um, so if I draw it here, so then okay, it is doesn't work. So we need to do a little bit of um, how can I write things in here? Text. Okay, so this I don't have to do that. And draw or, or let's do this. So, so this will be the best one to do. Use it and solve it. So my five day beard is given, right? Beard five is given 210, and the beard ultimate is given this. So what is my equation? My equation is uh, BOD at any time T is equal to plus zero means ultimate BOD, then one minus PDB4 minus KT. I will use this uh, small k because the E base that I'm uh, using here, uh, let me erase part of it, remove that. So if this is the case, now BODT, BOD5 is given to us, right? So BOD5 is 210. So 210 is equal to L0, we don't know. Uh, so yeah, it is given 363. Uh, then one minus it will be power minus K. Then T is equal to five, right? Because it's five degree is given. So this is the equation looks like. So now only unknown is k. And from here, what I can do? So one minus one minus e to the power minus the k, sorry, five k, this would be five k. Five k is equal to would be 210 divided by uh, 363, right? So 363, so I'll know a value over here. So then uh, if I do this, it will be minus, it will be minus five k equal to the one minus this, right? So then uh, how can I get the value of k whenever it is equal to this? Then if I take a log, then it would be um, negative 3k, equal to whatever the log I take. Then uh, from there, k should be calculated easily. So this is one way to calculate the value of k uh, from the system. I mean, if I know that some other value is really part or really three. So the another way to calculate the k. But we'll learn how to use the lab value to calculate the k value from there. So next the next question. So anybody has any question on that? Is it okay? Or you want me to solve the, the um, other part of it? If I raise this, oh, sorry. Uh, raise this, sorry. Raise this here. Okay. Now, if I go back here, so it would be like said, uh, it would be power minus 5k is equal to, uh, this is small k, uh, equal to 
1 minus uh, 2 10 divided by 363. So if I do the math, this will become uh, basically 2 10 divided by 363 uh, minus 1 is 1 2 to 1. This becomes 1 4 to 1. Okay. So then I'm going to take log in both sides. So I'm going to erase that. I'm going to take log in both sides, both space. Sorry guys, because I erased it to build the same one. So I'll do log of e to the power minus 5k, okay, equal to log of 0.4. So this will become this negative a lot of 0.4 to 1. Um, the natural log is a negative 0.86, negative 0.86. Okay. Now, if I take a log, this is E base, then E base and log, then the, the value would be just the power. So in this case, it would be uh, mi minus 5k uh, would be equal to of negative 0.86. Okay, now from here, k would be equal to small k, definitely, would be equal to 0 0.173. 173. So unit is k inverse, so that's what I'm saying. Okay, that's how I did it. Okay, let's move forward. Any questions on that? I have to erase it, otherwise, then we'll show that in the next one. Okay. Yeah, I have to raise it otherwise I can move forward. It doesn't go with the slide, the change is over. Okay. So any questions guys on the problem solving? Or is it too much problem for you guys? Too much problem solving. So you can let me know. The next one is the graphical determination of BOD uh, constant in this case. Uh, the equation of BOD at any time t, we know this one. Okay? Now, you guys are familiar with the uh, exponential function expansion, uh, Fourier series and other uh, series expansion. So if I do the series expansion and everything, then it becomes basically a uh, higher order uh, terms, negative and the factorial thing. So, and if I trim those out uh, high order term, meaning the smaller term, and keep a three of those and rearrange those, then it becomes like that. So I can rearrange those. So t over y to the power one third equal to k l zero to the power negative one third, k to the power two third divided by six l zero to one third and two. So this equation can be made equivalent to a y equal to mx plus c. That means this would be y, this would be uh, m, this would be x, and this would be C, the whole thing would be C. And this is a straight line, right? Straight line, if I draw a straight line, then the, the main thing intercept would be the C, and M would be the slope, we should be able to find it. Once we find M and C, then we can use the two equations from here. So Y equal to this, X equal to T, M equal to this, C equal to this. So if I know my M and C from these two equations, this and this, I should be able to calculate my k and l0. So if I do that, then k is equal to 6m over c, and l0 equal to 1 over 6m c squared. 1 over 6m c squared, okay? 6m c squared, so there's the equation. So that's how we can uh, find the, given in the k value for the document. So what is the procedure that we do? From the experimental results of BOD for various values of t, calculate t over yt, that means the time over the BOD and make it to the power one part. Then the plot T over Y T versus the time on a simple graph paper and draw a line that of the state by I. Determine the intercept C and the slope M from the plot and calculate the value of K and L zero from the above equation, the equation that I showed you before, right? So we'll solve the problem. So this is the problem using Thomas graphical method. Calculate the BOD rate constant K is E base and ultimate BOD from the following data. These are the data given to us. Two day BOD is 119, five day BOD is 210, 10 days 262, uh, 20 days is 279, 35 is 279.98.
So then what I did from here, I added this thing, t over y to the power one third. When I did two over 119, then I took a power of one third, then I got these values. And similarly, all of those, I did this as well. Now I'm going to plot these values in the y-axis and t is in the x-axis. So if I did it, and I use Excel to do that, so I have something like that, okay? I have something like this, meaning, so in this case, uh, then I can draw a line over here. Uh, then this would be my intercept, and the slope would be the factor of unit time. I calculated this slope is 30.5, and that 30.4, and the other one is 0.27. Okay, so if I know this, then I'm going to calculate the C is 0 0.2540 from here, and the M equal to uh, the slope. I can take directly this or I can calculate by my hand if I don't have this option in the exam, and definitely we do the, the uh, lights uh, from the block. So then k equal to 6 m over c, uh, 6 times m over c is 0.17, L0, 1 over m, m c square, 6 m c square, we calculate it together, I got 350. So my k value is equal to 0 0.17 day inverse per day, and the 351, for the, for the, what is called as a So this would be another way to solve a problem. I mean, the, to find the real rate constant using the, uh, the lab data, using the laboratory data, so that would be Any questions? Okay, so I think it's a good time to uh, take a break. I think we are halfway through. Uh, some of you may be following the script. So I think uh, let's take a uh, seven to 10 minutes break, then we'll be back in, in uh, seven to 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you guys. Uh, see you in seven to 10 minutes.
Okay, I'm back. Uh, <clears throat> everybody's back. Okay. Okay, we can start now. Um, now the next topic, as I said, is laboratory measurement of DOD, how we measure it in the uh, lab. So I'll discuss a little bit, not a whole lot on that one. So standard methods of examination of water and wastewater by American Water Works Association. Uh, that's the one you follow in the laboratory to do that. Teacher dilution of wastewater samples, teacher blind, incubate the sample and uh, blind for five days at 20 degrees Celsius, measure the dissolved oxygen remaining and calculate the DOD of that. So that is DOD at any time is dissolved oxygen available at the sample at the saturation level uh, initially, then the uh, dissolved oxygen at the, the uh, like say, a blank any time uh, is uh, like say at the time, uh, times the dilution factor. So the dilution factor, I'll tell you how to calculate the dilution factor of the dilution. So in this case, the sample size or sample, uh, what do you call it, is a dilution percent, or percent dilution. We can call the same. Volume of diluted sample divided by volume of diluted, um, undiluted sample divided by volume of diluted sample into uh, 100. And dilution factor is the 100 divided by this. For example, if I have a 20 milliliter of sample in my date, I make negative 100. 100 milliliters. So that means what did I do? I added 80, right? I added 80 milliliter of water, distilled water or tap water, and 20 milliliter was my test. So undiluted would be what? It'd be 20, and in the bottom would be 100. So diluted sample, right? So it would be 20 percent would be in this case 20 in this case. So, uh, uh, so like a dilution factor would be other around 100 divided by the percent dilution. So in this case, dilution factor would be what? Five, right? Because if I have 100 and sample dilution percent is 20, so 100 by 20 would be dilution factor would be five. So if I use this equation, volume of sample, volume of dilution, means volume of sample is 20, volume of dilution is 80, so volume of sample is 20. So 20 plus 80 is 100 divided by 20 is equal to five. So either way, either we do this way or this formula, I get the same thing, right? The dilution factor is equal to five. So in this equation, whatever I said in dilution factor, that means if I do 20 and 80 mixing, then the dilution factor will be five. Whatever the value I get here, and multiply with five, then I'll get the value of the theory of the original sample. Not the diluted sample, the original sample. So that's how we do it. <coughs> so, um, the, although 5 p theory has been chosen as the standard value for most wastewater analysis and regulatory purposes, ultimate theory is actually a better indicator of the total strength. As I mentioned before, that the 5 is an industry standard, but it doesn't mean always we stick to that. This gives us a very, very understand, good understanding, but finally I have to know exactly, we have to know like, what is the ultimate theory, the final theory. So that's very important. So here is one of the examples uh, I'm showing here. So there are two different ways. Industrial waste, the K value is 0.15. Municipal wastewater, the K value is this. They, they have the same 5 the BOD, but their ultimate BOD is not the same. This one has a ultimate BOD 457. This one is 223. So this is positive. So that's why industrial wastewater may have a higher BOD. Whereas if I just use the 5 the BOD, that means it's misleading, right? Because both are the same. So that's the another reason. So we, we have to make so this is another uh, thing like that. You, you see here, the 5 day BOD for this waste is 21, for that one is 50. So, but if I say ultimate BOD, it looks like ultimate BOD is the same. So in this case, ultimate BOD is the same because if I don't have the ultimate BOD, then what I'm going to do, I'm going to say that, oh, this waste is better than this. Uh, this is better than this. Finally, probably it's not. 
in five day it could be this but ultimately overall they are the same right their strong strength are the same so they are the same kind of power so that's why knowing the five day beauty and ultimate beauty it helps us to finally decide uh, basically the strength of the waist the degree of the waist okay next thing that we'll do beauty sector visual optics sector uh, or sweater tops model in order to do that um, we have to do a few more assumptions and this kind of stuff what we do is called the self purification so this uh, concentration of visual oxide in a river is an indicator of the general health of the river that also represents the capacity for self purification because why it is like that because we said that the microorganism takes the oxygen uh, from the water and use it to decompose the organic content as well one of the major tools of the water quality management in rivers is the ability to assess the capacity of stream to us absorb the waste so how much waste we can put it in there i mean ultimately the by definition but still it will make the the water quality standards so, yeah. so this is done by determining the profile of bio you see the bio profile out there is the bio profile concentration of downstream from a waste discharge the profile is called the bio sector because this has been set in the so this is the one i'm talking about this is the reserve oxygen this is the distance of the time it can be done with the time or distance there is a relationship between both so this is the saturation level based on the temperature and everything this is the initial deficit this is the deficit at any time and from the bottom it is available from the top it is the deficit okay so the critical <laughs> the critical condition was in here because this is the highest deficit and lowest available and it looks like it could be a little bit more than 2 right 2.5 dB So we see here 2.5. Then after some time, it went back. Looks like again close to five. Okay. So this is the typical weight. So if I show you another diagram, really what is happening here is this. So this is the starting point. So for example, somebody is uh, discharging something over here. Okay. The so the waste is discharging. Initially, dissolved oxygen of the river water has a high. Then the biochemical oxygen the BOD. That means BOD requirement. Was not that high because it was very small, right? So when we discharge the water, then mix it, and this uh, the the uh, BOD demand went high, and the oxygen is going down because why the microorganism are using the oxygen over there, so that's why it's happening. At some point they came here, then it's going up, right? It looks like two ppm here, then went up. So that means we are looking for this, mainly how much it is of oxygen over there. That will dictate. Whether there will be fish or not, this zone is called the clean zone. Right, this clean looks like you see fish, some insects, and everything. This is decomposition zone. That means this area decomposition is happening. Oxygen being used, and this is septic zone. That means this is the lowest zone. The oxygen amount is very low over there. And recovery zone is coming back. Right, is coming back. Then the clean zone. So this and this are desirable. You see some of those. They have a fish. They have a fish here. They have a very high level fish one here. Here, not a lot of fish. So one of the usage of this thing is like so if we do want to forecast for the farmers, uh, sorry, the fishermen and other things, we can do that. So if I know a river that doesn't have anything like that, then what is going to happen? They will not have any fish. So they will go here like so 50 miles. There is no fish. So the, the day would be waste. So if we can uh, issue a warning for the uh, for the fishermen, it would be great for them, right? So that's how the how we can do it. So now. So. Uh, how we do the the modeling? So we use the mass balance equation. Mass balance equation means mass coming in, mass uh, absorbed or mass uh, uh, like say accumulated than whatever is going out. They have to be equal. So that means this is the mass of the in the river, then the mass of the waste water coming in, and whatever the mass of the uh, these are the same area has to be the same. This plus this has to be equal to the same because they are mixed. So I have some explanation over here. So if I do uh, basically mass of the This is the flow rate, and this is the the concentration of dissolved oxygen. Flow rate times dissolved oxygen, it gives the mass per unit time, right? Mass flow rate, because Q is what? So Q is the the volume per unit time, and this is mass uh, per unit volume. Volume 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 cancel out, then it remains mass per unit time. Now mass flow rate, so this would be mass. So, okay, um, that's how we do things like that. So mass balance again. Mass of the dew in the river after mixing equals to the uh, sum of the mass of the flows. That means this is mass, this is mass, 
after the mixing of the keto vegetables. Uh, and the BOD after the mixing, if I have the waste BOD is L and the, the uh, right fever BOD is L, LR, so that's how the keto will be. So it's a, 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 a. Okay, so now here, this is the one we call it the weighted average. So the way that we weight it may be, if I have a dissolved oxygen for the flow waste in the river, I have a flow rate of the waste in the river, then the weighted average would be, uh, this is the flow rate of the waste times flow of dissolved oxygen for waste, and time, same thing divided by the flow ratio, okay? So this is called basically weighted average. The same the temperature, we can do that weighted average. So we know that the time waste. So this is the problem that we'd like to see how we make this weighted average. So I have a stream A and stream B. The stream A flow is 2.7, temperature is 21, diesel is 4.5. Here it is, flow is 2.5, temperature is 17, and diesel is 4.5. Now I'm looking for the flow, how much will be the flow at stream C, temperature and diesel C. What is the best way to do that? The, the uh, weighted average. The other thing that we know from fluid mechanics, uh, continuity equation. If I have a two flow coming in one place, I just add them up to become Q1, QA plus QB equal to QC would be the uh, continuity equation, okay? So in this case, the flow rate would be easily 3.7 plus uh, like 2.5 would be equal to uh, 6.2, right? 6.2 meter two per second. Then the remaining temperature and reserve of set will be the weighted average. I have the solution over here. So here is the, the flow rate is very easy. Uh, Temperature at the C is temp uh, temperature at A, flow at A, plus temperature at B, flow at B divided by the flow. I get 19.4 degrees Celsius. Similarly, if I do the dissolved oxygen for the C, dissolved oxygen A, then flow A, dissolved oxygen B, flow B divided by the flow is 5.7. So this is we call it weighted average. So this would be very helpful for us to solve the problem better. Now, uh, we calculate, uh, in order to do the model, uh, second model, we calculate the deficit. So deficit will give me whatever the saturation level we have, whatever the dissolved oxygen is the available at any time. So there's a deficit. Now, DOS is kind of constant because it depends on the temperature, okay? So I'll show you a table here, this table. Zero degree can have a full thing and so on. The temperature goes up, the dissolved oxygen goes down. So temperature goes up, dissolved oxygen goes down. So 45 is 5.95. So if it goes more than that, I don't have the data more than that. So if it goes more than that, then it be temperature. Too. That's why if it is 100 degrees Celsius or so, then temperature, I mean the oxygen is equal to zero. That's why we have a lot of fish kill and other things. We can make responsible both, right? One could be saying that, oh, it is too much heat that the fish cannot take the heat as for your time. The other reason could be because of the too much of the heat, the oxygen level in the uh, water is close to zero. So that's why they can get any oxygen and they die. So it could be affected both, right? So that was the, the main idea of, like, say, uh, doing this. So why the DOS is a constant. So DOS would be a little bit of constant in here. Now, if it is a constant, then uh, I can say the, uh, the, the initial deficit. Initial deficit would be, if I go back to one of the figure that I showed before, uh, I should have it over here. The initial deficit that we show over here is this. So what about the saturation level, whatever the initial we have would be the initial deficit. Okay. So in this case, we'll calculate the initial deficit. The initial deficit would be DOS, saturation level, then the, this is the mixing, that means very high. So initial, uh, like say, would be very much kind of using what is called uh, the initial condition and boundary condition. Something will be able to use that. So my initial deficit would be saturation level minus the DOP diesel oxygen after the mix. So we have to do a few assumptions. In this case, assumptions are these are the one coming. These are the one contributing. Contributing is wastewater diesel oxygen being contributed. A is the uh, atmosphere, whatever is coming. P is the photosynthetic, photosynthetic oxygen production. These are the user. So one is using is the benthic fauna, the demand, and this is microorganism, okay, uh, is by this is nitrogenous microorganism. This is R is the algal respiration. Out of all of those, these three, M, N, and R, they are very, uh, sorry, B, N, and R are very simple. Only the major one is the microorganism. So that's why 
After simplification, we have just user is the micro user. Here, uh, the uh, photosynthetic process would be very low or zero because if we don't have any trees plant, just here. So we are having the contribution by the wastewater as well as by the atmospheric air. So we'll be using this one to generate the noise. Okay. So we'll be using just this one to generate. So in these cases, this is my equation. I told you that, right? D equal to DOS minus DO, whatever it is. Now, if I do the first derivative of that, so this would be zero. Why this would be zero? D DOS over this because of this is a constant. So D D D D T D uh, D O over D T would be equal to zero. So from this one, this equal to this. So this is my equation number seventeen. The rate at which the oxygen uh, disappears that coincide with the DOD degradation rate. That means D D D equal to this equal to DOD. So other than saying dissolved oxygen, we can say DOD from here because the same thing, right? Now, if my main equation that I had DOD T equal to L0 minus LQ, then I'll put LQ equal to whatever you can put it equal to like this. I'll do another uh, differentiation over here. So that means this would be equal to zero. Why? Because L0 is a constant. So in this case, I got D, uh, DOD over DT equal to negative EL to DT. Now from equation 19 and the one equation before from this one, these are the same. Uh, so I can say this left hand side would be equal to the other one, the right hand side. So from that one, I have d d d t equal to minus k d l t. So in this case, I can say that because of this is a kind of constant. Now this constant is called the deoxygenation rate constant, the rate at which oxygen being used in this case. Okay. So uh, now I have one equation. Now I'm going to do the other part of it. So if I use this, like said, the rate of oxygen mass transfer into solution from the air has to be the first order reaction kinetics also. And the actual concentration due to oxygen deficit D D O over D T equal to K into D O S minus D D equal to K D because this is equal to D deficit. So from equation 17 and 21, uh, 17 we had the equation 17 we would be this, right? So from this one, uh, what I can say here, I can uh, just do the deal for the Now equation 22 and equation this, 20, we should be able to find just one equation. So in here, K2, we use a K2 value. K2 is a real uh, real constant or real oxygenation constant. This is represented by K2 rather than this two. If I combine these two equations, the equation becomes like this. D, 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 that means deficit and infant, K1 LT minus K2 D. This is the deficit, this is the remaining oxygen and other Okay. Now, LT can be put L0 to the minus KT. That means this equation can be converted into this. So then uh, this equation can be arranged like that. So this is a, another equation, which is a first order differential equation in the form of this. Then we can solve it by integrating factor. So if I have integrating factor and I put the integrating factor, this becomes like that. So, so by separation of variables, uh, and I do the solution, I get the solution is like that. Then I'm going to use the initial condition at D equal to D0 or T equal to T0. If I put it in here, then I get a uh, C value, C is a constant of integration. I get a value D0 minus this. So then if I put the value back to this equation, I get this. If I rearrange this equation, it becomes like this. Okay? So this is the final form of the equation. I'm, I'm going a little bit of quick because we don't have enough time. So uh, this is my final equation of the uh, deficit, uh, oxygen deficit. It's, it's a combination of K1, L0, K2, K1, then it to the power K1, T minus it to the power K2, T plus D0 to the power minus K2, T. So this is the E base, right? I can write the same equation as a 10 base. So I think 10 base equation is reliable. I didn't highlight it because most of the time I'll be using the, the E base one, not the 10 base one, okay? So this is my basic equation. Now we have to do a little bit of uh, basic equation, some changes. So one, number one condition that will be critical condition means where will be the maximum deficit minimum oxygen available because that's the condition would be very bad because you know, if, if the, the oxygen level goes very down, there'll be no much uh, like so equality light over here. So first thing is, if we do K1 equal to K2, then equation becomes like that. So it's not directly from here, Right, it's not directly from here because we need some kind of other analysis, expansion, and other things when we come up with it. Okay, so.
So for uh, like a critical condition, uh, any equation. So what do we do for this one? So for example, if I take this equation, like this equation, if I take the, the take the first derivative and put the first derivative equal to zero, then solve it, we get a value, right? And if the second derivative is negative, then this would be maximum value. If the second derivative is positive, it's the minimum value. It's called the maximum minimum rule, okay? Maximum minimum rule in this case. So that's what I'm going to do here. What we did, we did the first uh, first derivative, put equal to zero, then we put the t equal to tc because this would be my critical condition. Then I got the tc value equal to this, one over k t minus k1 log of whole thing. Then if the, the, and the D, dc would be uh, calculating from there, this would be k1 by kt, tells it to the minus kt. So these are the two equations we use to calculate the critical time, what time we get to see the d critical, and this is the amount of deficit, okay? So now this two equation can be calculated for k1 equal to k2, and these are basically k1 is not equal to k2. If they are equal, then the tc will become like that, and dc will be. Okay, if the k1 and k2 are the same. Okay, so the oxygenation rate constant, how can we measure this? As I mentioned, that this can be done in the lab of the way we did over there. Other option is once we know in the lab, then we have to adjust a little bit. So the view the rate constant really uh, has a value of the 11.7. K1 may be uh, like say, as large as 7 uh, eight of So I think it's, it's the uh, K1. So Vasco has a developed another estimated K1 from using K characteristics of the stream. So here is the equation the Vasco used it. K1 equal to K, uh, then divided by D divided by H times E up. K1 except the oxygenation rate constant at 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, and D average speed, K equal to BOD rate constant. There's a BOD rate constant, K is average depth. And eta is the bad activity, efficient activity. So here are the values. So if I put everything there, uh, K is ultimately the same as, uh, correction is the same as that we saw before, right? Uh, it would be K theta to the power uh, T minus one. So these are the equations we can use. And for the K2, uh, here is the equation we can use K2. The V and H are the same. So here are the temperature correction for the, the V2. So uh, we are going to solve one problem here. Uh, it's a big problem uh, that we'll be solving for using this kind of equation, okay? So this, uh, this problem is showing us, like so it's the municipal wastewater treatment plant discharge secondary effluent to a surface. The worst condition unknown to occur in the uh, summer months when the stream flow is low and water temperature is high. Under these conditions, measurements were made in the laboratory and in the field to determine the characteristics of the wastewater and the stream flow. The wastewater is found to have a maximum flow rate of 15,000 millimeters per day, and the BO a five of 40 milligram per liter, and the dissolved of oxygen of 4 milligram per liter, and a temperature of 25. So all of those that I mentioned here, these are the, the wastewater, right? Then the next thing is uh, the the uh, stream upstream from the point of the discharge is found to have a minimum flow rate of 0.5 liter per second. Remember that this is middle two per day, this is middle two per second. We have to bring them in a one unit. Then BOD5 of three, reserve of oxygen is three, and temperature is 22. Complete a mixing of the wastewater and stream is, is instantaneous. Let me right away it happens. And the velocity of the mixture is 0.2 meter per second. That's the flow rate after the mixing. Uh, it looks like velocity of the water flow, not the flow rate, the velocity of the water flow. Uh, from the flow regime, the reaction rate constant is K2 is equal to 0.4 at 20 and catch the BOD, sketch the BOD profile up to 100 meters per liter H and assume K1 is equal to 0.3 to K1. So they, by reading this problem, it looks like it's giving you a lengthy problem. Right, so in case of being an engineer, what you can do, you can convert a big linguistic problem into a, a pictorial view or visualization view in a simple way. That's what I'm going to do. So here is the one that I did come from. The whole thing that I had in a whole page, now I see in a one, one graph that should be very easy to understand, right? So this is the wastewater flow. The wastewater QW equal to this, then I convert it into uh, meter cube per second. What I did is one day is equal to 
86,400 meters right? Just divided by that, so I get 0.37. And DOD5, what the waste is 40, DOD5, uh, dissolved oxygen waste is 2, temperature waste is 25. Here it is for the stream. Flow rate is 0.5 meter cube per second. DOD5 is 3, a dissolved oxygen at um, 8, and like uh, temperature is 22 degrees Celsius. Probably I should put those in a river, the river, river, because I, I will have a mix up with the S, the OS, and the something else. Okay, this is the velocity of the flow. These are the K1 and K2 value at 20 degrees. Now, uh, I will do, a, like say, a step by step. First step that we do is calculate the mixed flow rate. So the stream QS, uh, the stream is 0.5, and the waste water is 15, has a meter cube per day, is ultimately 0.17. The total mix would be 0.5.17.6. Calculate the mix DOD5. So the DOD5 for the stream is C, and for the waste water is this. Then I use the, uh, the you see this equation is a, a what called the weighted average, right? I put it together, I get 12.4. And then this is the, uh, the 5 degree, right? This is the 5 degree of the people. And the K1 equal to 0.33. I'm going to adjust and find the L0 because L0 is a part of the equation that I need. So L0 is equal to YQ over this, I get 18.1. Calculate the mixed dissolved oxygen. Uh, the dissolved of two are given, I use the same equation, I get 6.5. Calculate the mixed temperature. Uh, they are two given, I use the similar equation. Uh, like what it average, I get 22.8 of the Celsius, right? So now I'm going to do the other step. So I'll do the correction of the, the temperature correction of the two-way constants. For K1, if I do that, I get 0.26 because it's more than 20 degrees Celsius. That's why I got it. If I do for K2, 0.4 is given. So if I do the temperature correction, I get 0.43. So in this case, K1, for K1, I'll be using 0.26. K2 is I'll be using 0.43. Now, determination of oxygen, uh, uh, initial oxygen deficit, B0. At temperature, uh, this, uh, 22, I got DOS is equal to 8.7 from table 2. Therefore, deficit is equal to this. You remember table 2, right? So, 22.8, let's go back to the table and see what should be the value. So, if I go back uh, to the table, table was at 3, right? I should have a table for a little while. Okay, here is the table, right? So it's 22.8 degrees Celsius. So here it is 22, here it is 23. So if I do the interpolation, uh, it looks like it could be very close to like that, not close to like that. So this is 8.68, then it's going up. So I use 8.7. It may not be exactly right, but if you do the linear interpolation, probably it will come to 8.71, 8.70. So, so that's what I did. Okay? It's a linear interpolation, or I just did put a guess in there. It's very close. Right? So that's what uh, that's that's what I have here, eight point seven, and my uh, initial deficit would be saturation level minus mix. Saturation is eight point seven, and the mix uh, I have the eight before bio mix was uh, six point five. So if I do subtract that from there, I get two point three. Is that initial? In the next step, we'll find the TC value, where it would be my uh, critical time, at what distance of the time would be the more uh, lowest uh, available oxygen and highest deficit. So if I use this equation, because K1 and K2 are not equal, then I get 2.51 day. And if I calculate the DC, using this equation, I get 5.83. This uh, correction, uh, condition offers at a distance of whatever the distance that I calculate. 0.2 is the base thing, I did 17.28. Then XC would be equal to uh, point to this uh, this kilometer, yeah? uh, this time, this and this. Ultimately, would be uh, basically 42.4 kilometer. So that means either 2.51 day later, or at a distance of 43.4 kilometer, so it would be happening with critical condition waste available in high temperature. So okay. So then I'm going, since I need to plot it for 100 uh, kilometers, so what I'm going to do, I get three more points. I get to get a point at a distance of 20, 75, and 100. 
So, and from this equation, t equal to x over the velocity, the distance over velocity. So, I know that my velocity, velocity was what? Uh, like say, uh, 17 by 8 kilometer per hour, hour per day. So, if I divide it by this, 20 by this, then I get 1.16, 75 by that, so 4.40 and so on. Then I calculate using this equation, I calculate B20. B20 means would be uh, T would be equal to 1.16. If I use this equation, I get 5.03. Similarly, I didn't show all of those. I use B75, B100, I got this, this, and this. So I got the deficit. Now, the deficit from the top, but when I plot it, I plot it from the bottom, right? So I have to calculate the dissolved oxygen availability. So here is the dissolved oxygen availability at the zero uh, distance would be the initial one, what about the mixing? And at 20 would be 8.7 minus this 2.67. At 43, that means this is a critical, would be 2.87. 75 would be this, and 100 would be this. So ultimately, then I plotted this. So if I plotted it, it looks like this. So this is the saturation level. Uh, this is the set curve, and this is the set curve using all of those. So this would be my uh, critical dissolution. This would be the deficit, highest deficit. My critical point would be happening here, 43. Point or kilometer distance from the zero. So that's it. So there's the problem. It's a little bit big problem, uh, but uh, basically uh, it's a good good uh, practice to do so we know how to solve this problem. Okay? So that's the reason I took a little bit bigger. Okay, now the management strategy, what kind of strategy we do to manage those uh, BSF models and how we use those. The beginning point of water quality management reverts using BSF is to determine the minimum view function that will protect the aquatic life in the river. This value called bio standard is generally protect most sensitive species that exist or could exist in a particular area. So most of the time, I think the graph that I showed you before, if it goes below two or around two, then I don't see any fish, right? We don't see any fish. Uh, for the most of the fishes, it's around four milligram per liter is the uh, oxygen level to be there. So the standard we can say that for river standard, it has to be four. If it goes below four, it means it's the polluted. It's not a good. For a known waste discharge and a known set of river characteristics, BSA equation can be solved to find the BO at the critical point. We have seen that, right? If this value is higher than the standard, then the stream can adequately assimilate the waste. If it is less than not, if the DO at critical point is less than the standard, additional waste treatment is needed. Ultimately, uh, usually environmental engineer has come to over two parameters, A0 and B0. Other parameters are not, they don't have any control, it's controlled by the other parameters. When using DO sector to determine the adequacy of waste equipment, it is important to use the river condition that will cause lower DO concentration, especially in the summer. Frequently used is 10 year, seven day low flow. Okay, we use low flow causes the higher values of L0 and D0 due to the reduction dilution. The value of K2 is reduced by low flow due to the reduced velocity. Okay. So higher temperature increases K1 and K2 values. So it is DO saturation, making the critical more severe. Okay, limitation of the set curve. DO set curve equation is based on the assumption that there is one source of DOD and there are maybe several point of So that's the disadvantage of that. The other one is, is a one dimensional. We just calculate the distance. We didn't calculate the vertical and horizontal. We just calculate where the uh, flow values. So this would be another, uh, like so. It's one dimensional uh, model. It's not a three dimensional or three dimensional model. Additional discharge can be taken into consideration by subdividing a river into short reaches, uh, each fed by a single point source. So that means if I have a multiple discharge point, that means then I have to divide into a different multiple segment and get the, the, the what is called the equation for different segments. I have a question over here. Uh, so this question, I'm just answering that here. Uh, John Searing is uh, asking question, if there are several sources, do you combine or just take the worst case scenario? Now, in this case, this model doesn't allow us to combine those. In these cases, we have to deal, deal one by one. If I have a one in a certain point, and after two mile, I have another one, then I have to do first two mile one model, then the another model from the, the 
starting point to the other one. So that's the another disadvantage of this model. So hopefully I answered your question. Okay. So um, here is the one subdividing into river into short reaches, each fed by a single pump. So that's the answer of the question. Okay. So uh, if the tributary is empty into a mainstream, any discharge uh, they may have received must also be taken into consideration, especially for the flow conditions, as well as the increase in the flow in the receiving stream. Replacement of oxygen is also affected by the many factors not taken into consideration by the formulas used to derive the factors, notably the re-aeration contribution by al algal photosynthesis. It's not a huge contribution, that's why our assumption was we are not going to consider. The Biosecca equation obtained from the mathematical models should be confirmed, calibrated by a field measurement. We can do that. If we uh, make model, then go to the field and, and our kind of like say measure the dissolve of in different places and try to put it in there. If it matches, then this model is good. Once the DO deficit and the time of critical of DO concentration have been verified by detailed water quality survey, dissolve of itself. Uh, set curve can be used to filter stream conditions that can be expected for given waste load and the stream flow. Effects of nutrients in the river water quality. Nutrients can contribute to deteriorating water quality in river by causing excessive plant growth as nutrients are those elements required by plants for their growth, especially nitrogen and phosphorus. These are the two and plus some other a variety of waste elements. So, uh, the, there are three reasons why nitrogen is detrimental to the river quality. One is, is a high concentration is very toxic to fish. Other one is a low concentration of nitrate, and nitrate serves as the nutrient for excessive growth of algae, because ammonia can be converted into nitrate very easily. The conversion of ammonium to nitrate consumes large quantities of dissolved oxygen. So this can be considered as a, also as a oxygen, oxygen demand on the as a oxygen demand. So, phosphorus. Phosphorus serves as a vital uh, nutrient uh, for the growth of algae. Excess of phosphorus help to grow excess of algae. When excess of algae die, they become uh, oxygen demanding organic matter, as well as this, uh, like, say, decrease the depth. So, this part is called basically uh, eutrophication. So, eutrophication basically happens what happens the uh, algae grows due to nitrogen over there. When algae dies, algae itself becomes organic, means is a friend of many materials. So as you said, becomes a pollution, right? So that's called eutrophication. The oxygen demand frequency overtakes the DO supply of water as a consequence causes fish to die. So it could be temperature has a one effect, other one effect is the, the excessive amount of uh, like the oxygen demanding material discharge to the water or the wastewater, I mean more wastewater over here, or more DOD. Either way, or we can call it more out of this. So, management strategy of with excess of nutrients. It is based on the sources of each of the nutrients, controlling the source and discharge of the high nutrient waste to the stream. So, uh, controlling the source is the best option for us. So, if we don't control it there, then uh, there is no real other treatment to low flows, other than uh, you have to bring all the water back to the building. So, in certain cases, we do a little bit of treatment in the source, the wastewater treatment. Uh, nitro water and other things can remove some of the nitrogen. Phosphorus, yeah, we have to do it, some kind of biological treatment process, or maybe nitrogen phosphorus both can be done with the precipitation process, the chemical process also, by very chloride or element. So uh, this is my last problem here, looks like, problem number six, a tenary waste, uh, tenary with a waste of flow of, of 0.011 meter cube per second, and DOD5 is 590, discharged into a quick. The creek has a 10 year 7 day low flow of 1.7 meter cube per second. Upstream of the standard DOD 5 is 0.6. Uh, uh, the, the DOD rate constant is 0.115 for the tannery, and this is for the creek. So the temperature of the both of the creek and the tannery is 20. Calculate the initial ultimate DOD after mixing. So this will be a little bit different way. The first thing, these are the information given. So I will calculate the ultimate DOD for the, the waste. And I'll waste in this case. So L0 equals the waste. That means this is the equation that I used. Uh, L 
LZ, uh, LA quality, LT quality, LZ residual minus P1 T. So ultimately, LED, ultimately, LED, this is the beauty to that the one minus the minus K is 1349.2. And if I do for the crick, it'd be 0.6 over this. Is I'm using this is k value for the base, this is 3.7 k value for the river for the click, the point Now I'm going to use the weighted average for this two. Okay. So weighted average would be L W Q W L R Q or divided by Q W Q W Q R. So this is this, and the flow is 0.11 or 0.011, and this is 0.6. The flow rate is 0.1.7 divided by the two flow rates, just like this. Ultimately, at 9.27, if we do the a uh, little bit of work, it's higher to the grounding, then it's non milligram So, this is another example of showing how to use the, the weighted average in the future. So, I think we are almost done. We have a few more minutes. So, in this uh, course, we define several terms related to the water pollution, such as PMDL, POD, theory. I think we did POD 5 also, right? 5 GO POD. And the dual oxygen explain the effect of oxygen demanding waste in the water pollution. So oxygen demanding waste, what is the, the thing that we discussed? We discussed that if we have oxygen demanding materials in the water, then the microorganism will take the oxygen from the water and decompose those uh, materials, oxygen demanding materials, right? Meaning this organic. So that's why the water would be like say the void of oxygen and a lot of fish and a lot of critical environment will be that. So that's the main reason we work. We learned how to determine BOD5 in the laboratory. I just discussed it. Then we learn it, we actually discussed it. How to do BOD rate constant, uh, use your reaction rate, K with a graphical method. I think I discussed it and we solved one problem, right? So we derived BOD model and BOD set part as uh, equations using first order kinetics. In there, we did both. I don't know how well I did, I, well, I was able to explain to you guys. Um, so you should be able to go back and take a look on those. We also solved several problems to understand the extent of water pollution and its control, right? Several problems in the sense we started with the theoretical oxygen demand, and we uh, from we did one uh, problem, like say finding the BOD5 and BOD other things like that, BOD3 ultimate BOD, then another problem to find the value of K. Then we solve another problem with the BOD sector. Uh, so if you find the value of K, then the sector. Then the final problem, the sixth problem that we did, we have to use the weighted average to calculate the, the mixing conditions of the, the river after mixing the river water. Available. So, and controller, we have said the main control would be uh, basically uh, main controlling the, the source, right? Because if we know that is happening the problem, this is the model, then we know, okay, that means you have to treat more and you are allowed to uh, like discharge less pollutant into the river in other places. Okay, so that's it. Um, I don't know whether I have the, the references and other things. A lot of references that I use in this case from different books. And also I have some work experience. I do a lot of research. Uh, some of my undergraduate students do the research on, on um, a BSI model a long time back. So I use some of the materials from there too. So these are the things that I have used. It looks like we have uh, six more minutes so I think we have enough time for question and answer. So I'm opening the floor now for any question and answer. So Hisham, can you open this thing so they can speak even if they want to? I didn't hear any voice, anybody, nobody is speaking. I'm Okay, so somebody might have a long discussion for comments, maybe. Okay, I am in central New York State where there are numerous freshwater lakes. Okay, in the past four years, there have been numerous occurrences of short day for the duration during a few hours of harmful algae blooms. Okay, films of the water surface that have caused swimming. Uh, um, Features can also raise concern about using the lake water uh, for first washing and dishwashing. Our New York uh, system and manager 
how the requirements have not been able to determine the cause of those blooms. Um, are these blooms result of adversary algebra uh, caused by inflow of nitrogen in transport? I think that's what it is. I think we had an issue when I was in Virginia. Uh, the, you know, the Philip Morris, right? Philip Morris, uh, they have a uh, factory over there in Richmond, Virginia. They were discharging their lot of wastewater, treated wastewater, but they didn't uh, do the nitrogen from there because they use the tobacco leaves. And tobacco leaves, anything has a lot of nitrogen in there. Then the algae bloom over there and the water was polluted. And I think a lot of fish even died because of the devoid of oxygen and other things. And ultimately, the Department of Environmental Quality that I was working for in there defined the, uh, the uh, lip moss. So, and at that time, determination was, yes, it was due to algae, algae growth, and algae growth happened due to the excessive nutrient that is coming from the discharge from the, uh, what is called the uh, Philip Morris uh, treatment plant, Philip Morris was for So I'm assuming the same over here, uh, but what they could do, they could probably, they might have some background data over there, they can take the uh, water from this side and measure the nitrogen and phosphorus, and probably they should do and uh, develop a database with the time. So, and also they can probably take a picture for the algae growth and other things like that. Uh, and correlate them. So that if you have more nitrogen, then you see more algae over there. Okay? If you say less nitrogen, less uh, uh, algae over there. So this could be one way to uh, do the monitoring and other things. Again, it costs a lot of money for the state, but if the state has money, they can do it. Uh, that's the way it should be. Hope I answered a question, right? Okay. So any other question? You are welcome. We have four more minutes. 